the page 391 at Calvary. Are we live? Yes. 391. I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing that it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul felt liberty at Calvary. By God's word and last my sin. Sovereign die, Lord, would he 
No, I'm taking you all the way. All right. So, uh, so tonight, um, last week, I, I, there was a chance that I wasn't going to be here tonight. So I had uh, I had to said something to Calvin Jr. about doing the lesson, the message tonight, and um, and lo and behold, um, I'm here. Um, but he got prepared, and uh, and I, I, we always enjoy to hear what the Lord gives him. So um, I I am going to step out of the way. And let him bring the message tonight. Um, but I did want to just make one mention um, for next week. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna do a I'm gonna start a message uh, series, a lesson series, I guess I, I should say rather, starting next week on on the five judgments. I've referred to it several times, and. Uh, and I, I've, I've taught on it before uh, several years ago, but um, it's, a, it's a good message. It, it holds a lot of bearing to what we've been talking about a lot recently on Sundays and, and, and the previous <coughs> Wednesdays in the past couple of months, I would say. So I think it's a good time, and, and to be honest, it was requested. So, um, all that being said, I prayed about it, and, um, and I've started studying up on it again, and looking at verses around the five judgments, and you say, okay, well, what are they? Well, be here tomorrow. Be here, tomorrow. <laughs> be here next week. Next Wednesday, we'll start looking at them, and um, we'll probably do, as I normally do when I start a lesson series, We'll do a bit of an overview of the five next Wednesday, and then we will dig into each one of them in order for the, the weeks thereafter. And um, dare I say, I think the Lord's got some good stuff for us. Um, come willing to, to hear what the Lord has to say. Uh, I'm going to use lots of Bible verses. Uh, plenty of, of explanation and, and illustration, um, but I'm going to try to let the Lord speak 100% and try to keep myself out of it as much as possible, um, and, uh, and, and just ask the Lord to give all understanding, amen? So, just a little, little something to look forward to next week, Lord willing, and, um, and we'll go from there, but for tonight... Calvin, come, give us what the Lord's given you. You can turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, chapter 1. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you this evening. We thank you for a chance to come together and open your word, your scripture, um, the words that you've given to us, Lord, that you've kept and you've um, been faithful through all of history yes. so that even today um, we can know the truth um, and, and know y you. <laughs> yes. Know you, Lord. Um and that we can not just learn about you, but learn to know you personally, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless this time that we have and that we can seek your face and, and um, be ready to hear and accept and receive, Lord, that you'll prepare us for it. And I pray, Lord, that your will be done tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So it's been a while since I've... Um, done any of my study on uh, David is where we were supposed to be, but then we were talking for a long time about Saul. So does anyone remember where we left off? It 
it was where David was we 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 talked about where David had the opportunities to uh, uh, take Paul out twice, Saul. or Saul, right? Yeah. And uh, and and didn't had the conviction of the Holy Spirit and 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 knew that it was wrong to touch the man of God, right? Though he was acting wickedly, right. Yeah, that's and we. I think we did that lesson, um, looking back, because right. if I remember correctly, I'm not certain, but this is where I remember being at least because we were working our way through First Samuel. Is we just came to the close of Saul's life. Um, right, right, right. I, I think that's where we left off last, and I think when we got there, we took a step and we looked back on all of those times that David had. Um, and that'll be slightly related to what we're talking about today. And this is actually kind of neat because this week I was listening to my Bible. And this that we're going to talk about tonight is something that I didn't know before. So it, it's new to me. And it's cool. And it's, uh, I, I like that. I like learning the scriptures. Yeah. And um, it's new to me, but it's a really obvious lesson that we can learn from it. And it's really clear and it's so important that the Bible says it three times, back to back, the same lesson. Uh, spoiler alert, there, there's three names written up there. Um, ignore it, I guess. <laughs> um, so, yeah, where, where, where we left off last time was the death of Saul. And Saul uh, committed suicide, that's commonly... Um, Kind of how it's perceived, but how he did that is he told one guy, "Hey, kill me," because he got hit by an arrow. He was dying. He was bleeding out, and Saul knew he was dying, and he didn't. Yeah, he didn't want to let the enemies come and get him and do bad things to him. Which, again, spoiler alert: after he's dead, they do it anyway. Uh, but at least he was dead. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, serious. That wasn't supposed to be a joke, but... <laughs> um, and he tells one of his soldiers there with him, Hey, kill me. Take me out. And the guy goes, No, I'm not doing that. I, I'm not doing that. And so at the end of 1 Samuel, it says that Saul fell on his sword, which is a nice way of saying he killed himself. But then at the opening of 2 Samuel... We have a slightly different account, which I think still works together. We'll read it. Verse 1. Now it came to pass, after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag, it came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was, when he came to David, that he fell to the earth. And did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? The young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mil Mount Gilboa, behold, <coughs> Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. And so Saul's on his, on his chariot, or however this is going down. They're running away from the enemy. He's leaning on his staff, his spear, 
His spear that he always has with him, because he's already always ready to just spear someone to a wall. <laughs> yeah. His spear that he always has with him, and he's leaning on it because he got hit with an arrow and he's dying. And I, it might say that here, but that's why he's. study before he had every opportunity to and Saul undoubted undoubtedly would have killed David And he said, you know, th th this isn't my thing to do. 
I have the opportunity, but I, I'm not going to take it. This isn't, this isn't my place. The, the, the blood isn't going to be on my hands. And so he let it be. He had the opportunity, but he didn't take the opportunity. And then someone else fixed the problem for him. You know, and of course, David wasn't waiting for someone to fix the problem because he loved Saul. And he would have served in Saul's court. But someone else fixed that problem for him. He didn't take it into his own hands. That, that's going to be our point tonight, is to not take it into your own hands. Even when opportunity, even when justified. So that's our first example, is Saul. Now, this is the stuff, this is all new to me. I'm, I'm really excited for this, actually. These next couple chapters, we're probably going to be doing a bit of reading. Um, but things weren't immediately great right after Saul died. You would have thought, oh, Saul's done. David's already been anointed. Everyone knows that David's going to be king. Everyone knows that. So David's king now, right? And, and it, didn't, it didn't go smooth. You, you'd think it would have been a smooth transition, but it wasn't. And so, and also, uh, I don't remember if we talked about this before, Verse 17 through 25 is awesome if you read it. It's just David talking about all the good of Saul and none of the bad. Even though Saul objectively was a horrible king and a bad person and ungodly, David still chose to look at him through a good lens. I just really like that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's something special. I think that it should be inspiring for us yes. on how we decide to remember people. We yeah. can be so negative, and when someone's gone, we just talk about all the negative things. When this guy literally tried to kill David, and all David had to say was the good things about him, it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, chapter 2, and it came to pass, verse 1, and it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up into any cities of Judah? And the Lord said unto him, Go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? And he said, Unto Hebron. So David went up thither, and his two wives also, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. And his men that were with him did did David bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. And the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh-Gilead were there that buried Saul. And so we're not going to get into the Jabesh-Gilead thing, but he rewards the guys that did good to Saul. They recovered Saul's body, they buried him. David does something special for them. We're not going to get into that right now. We're going to skip down to verse 12. <clears throat> and Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from. Wait, no. Let's go. My bad. Let's go. Verse. Verse 8. My bad. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanim, and made him king over Gilead, and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. So, there's no smooth transition. Um, I'm not certain if this is why um, when the two nations are split, why it's Judah and Israel. I, I have a feeling it has something to do with this. Because Judah accepts uh, David as king. And they stay loyal to David. And this guy, uh, Abner, is... Saul's old buddy from when Saul was going around hunting David down. Abner is his, uh, his captain of the armies. And he takes one of Saul's sons and behind the backs he makes him king. 
and proclaims Ishbosheth, king of Israel. And of course, he's the son of Saul. And so the people would see it as, you know, rightful throne. But after all of this time that David has been waiting to become king and running through the wilderness and, and trying to do things right, and, and he knows he's been anointed of the Lord and, and God promised that David would be king. And now this guy Ishbosheth becomes the king of Israel before David does. The next king of Israel wasn't David. It was this guy Ishbosheth for two years. I never knew that. I never knew that. This guy, David wasn't the next king. Ishbosheth was the next king. They stole the throne from under him. And so David is staying in Judah. And, and the, the tribe of Judah, the, the nation, Ish, not yet, but Ish, uh, all those people, they, they see David as king. They're treating David as king. But the rest of the entire nation sees Ishbosheth as king. And this guy, Abner, is pulling all the strings. There's um, going to be a couple names we're going to see. Um, and I kept getting them mixed up and confused, so I'm, I'm going to do this real quick. So this, this made it easier for me to remember. So you got Saul versus David. Right? And then Saul's son, Ishbosheth. And then you've got their captains, which is Abner on Saul's side versus Joab from David's side. I hope that makes it easier because I kept getting these names super confused and it was so hard to keep up. So hopefully that helps. So Saul is dead. So it's David versus Ishbosheth. He's the king of Israel. The stolen throne guy. And Abner is the one pulling all the strings. He, he's an equal to Joab on David's team. And he's going to come up a lot too. So. Uh, I guess we'll just keep going from verse 10. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to, Gil to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Jeriah, and the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. So what you've got now is you've got Abner and Joab. And they decide, we're going to meet up. And so there's this pool of Gibeon. And they're on either side. And they both have their men with them. And this part confused me so bad. But I'll explain it how it goes down. So they're on either side of the pool. They've got their men with them. And... Uh, Verse 14, And Abner said to Joab, Let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. Now, spoiler, they're not going to play. <laughs> the word play here is used very loosely. If you read the next verse. <laughs> um, let, let, the, let the boys play. So these guys are on either side of the pool, and they're having this meeting. Because th essentially, this is like a civil war, and so far there's been no battle from it. But th it's like a cold war going on. And so they have this meeting, the two guys are on the other side, the two captains, the big guys. That, and uh, they say, let the boys play. And I guess all the boys knew what that meant, because in verse uh, 15... Then there arose and went up by number twelve of Benjamin, which pertained to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. And they caught everyone his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. That's an interesting game right there. Yeah. 
That that's that's how you play a game. So that they fell down together, wherefore that place was called Hilkath Hazarim, which is in Gibeon. So and and I'm gonna skip down a little bit what happens, but there's this battle that happens, and they're like and I can't I don't know. Both of these guys kinda of seem like prideful jerks, to be honest. Um, but I can imagine them sitting there and they're like let the boys play. Let them play. Come on. And the other guy's like, all right, yeah. Yeah, let, them, let, let the guys play. And, the, and 12 versus 12, slaughter, complete slaughter. And then that turns into a whole battle and a war, and it gets completely out of hand. I don't know if it was done like, um, like honorably. It was supposed to be a 12 versus 12 match. I don't know. Apparently David's guys won. Um, I don't know if it was supposed to be honorable, but it spins into a full-out battle. And Abner's guys are losing this battle. And so they start running. And David's guys, Joab's guys, are chasing them. <clears throat> they're, they're hunting them down. And um, there's this one guy... It's actually Joab's brother. This part might sound familiar to you. I didn't know the context of this. Um, Joab's brother, um, and his name was Ahasiel. Poor Ahasiel. Let's see. That's not spelled. A S A H A. Ahasiel which is Joab's brother. And this dude's fast. And he gets it in his head that he's not letting Abner get away with this. And he's, he's going to get him. And, this, and he's fast, and he can run. And so, and he does. He just starts running. And uh, verse 19, And Ahasiel pursued after Abner, and in going he turned not to the right nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou at Hasiel? And he answered, I am. And Abner said unto him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or to thy left, and lay upon, and lay thee hold on one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Hasiel would not turn aside from following him. And he, so what, what Abner just said there was, Look, if you want to fight, get ready for a fight. All right? You, you don't want to mess with me. If you want to fight, go get ready for a fight. But this dude's just chasing after him. And apparently he's not armored up for it or anything. He's not, he's not really ready for a fight. But he, he has it in his, in his mind, I'm going to be the hero. I'm going to take out the bad guy. And it said, because verse uh, 20, 22, And Abner said unto Ahasiel, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold my face to Joab thy brother? Howbeit he refused to turn aside, wherefore Abner, with the hinder end of the spear, smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there, and he died in that same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Ahasiel fell down and died stood still. Joab and Abishai, his other brother, pursued after Abner, and the sun went down, and they were come to the hill of Amma, that lieth before Gia by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And so this guy Ahasiel dies because he got in his head that he wanted to be the hero. And Abner turns around and spear right through the dude, comes out the other side. Ahasiel falls on the ground, dies. And he's way ahead the rest of his soldiers, the rest of his you know guys in his army. And so as they are keep on chasing and chasing Abner, everyone sees him. And it's probably just a huge hit to the morale. And Joab takes it super personal. And uh, they get to this hill. And the armies of Abner, the bad guy, uh, they get to this hill, this wilderness. And then all of a sudden, the armies of Benjamin are there and no one saw it coming and and the armies of Benjamin join up with uh, Abner's armies and they're basically in a shouting match over the hills 
and um, Abner says, like, you're going to die. Like, don't come mess with us. Get over yourself. And um, Joab and his men decide that today's not the day. They're not going to keep forcing in. So they call off their armies, and they all head home. And um, this war rages on for two years, um, which if this guy, Ahasiel, I think there's a really good lesson in there, and I actually remember a little bit of it, but if he wouldn't have gotten in his head that it had to be done right then, right there, right. He, this guy wouldn't have had to die. But he was trying to take it into his own hands, yeah. and then they had to end up surrendering, surrendering anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> That's not really my point, but it is right. relevant. Yeah. Because Joab took it super personal, and Joab wants to avenge his brother. Joab is not happy with this guy, Abner. <sighs> and while that's going on, um, Ishbosheth. Right? King of Israel. And Abner also head back to their kingdom. And things aren't going great in the kingdom of Ishbosheth. Because <laughs> this sounds like it's about to go from 0 to 100, and it is. Um, because Ishbosheth, or I, actually, you know what? Before I do that, let me uh, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now, there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. Um, and skip down to verse... Mm. Yeah, verse 6. And it came to pass, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. And so, slowly, even though Judah is the smaller nation, nation, it's the smaller team versus the entire nation of Israel, um, God's blessing Judah. And they're becoming stronger and stronger as time goes on in this war. And the armies of Israel under Ishbosheth are, are becoming weaker and weaker. But this guy Abner, the general, of the armies of Israel. He's 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 all in. And he's strengthening himself and he he's proving his loyalty, which is ironic because <laughs> verse 7 and Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ai. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, "Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine?" Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head? So what happened was um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't want to be irreverent. But Ishbosheth just said to Abner, Did you sleep with my mom? That's kind of what happened. And Abner took it very personally because he did not, in fact, do that. And Abner took it very, very personally. Now remember, Abner's the one pulling all the strings. If it wasn't for Abner, Ishbosheth wouldn't have been the king. He was honestly just a puppet king. Yeah. Abner was the one pulling the strings, doing all the heavy lifting. Yeah. Ishbosheth just happened to be Saul's son. An unimportant one. Because he wasn't mentioned before this point <laughs> when it lists Saul's sons he's not listed <laughs> which means he probably was Ill illegitimate or something right he was he was a son but he wasn't listed with like Jonathan or anything like that so he was just he was just a puppet king abner was using him and abner abner gets real upset like and i mean and to be fair and that's pretty dirty and Abner, how could you? How could you say such a... I, as much as I've been doing for you. And um, verse 8. Am I a dog's head which, which against Judah doth show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father? 
to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? So do God to Abner, and more also, except as the Lord hath sworn to David, even so I do to him, to translate the kingdom from the house of Saul, and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. And so what Abner just said was, you little punk, you know what? I'm on David's team now. It, it really did happen that fast. It really did. And he says, you know what? I'm going to do, remember all that stuff we were supposed to do? <laughs> I'm gonna do that now, and then Ab or, and then Ishbosheth just ah, ah. You know, he because he's a nobody, he's a nothing, and so he's scared, and so they decide. Um, Abner sends a message to David and says, "Hey, I I want to help bring Israel to see you as king." Right, because you know he he has a lot of sway in Israel, being that he was you know the right hand of the king of Israel, and so he's saying like, hey, I I want everyone to recognize you as king, um, and David says, sure, um, but you're not allowed to see me. So he uses a bargaining chip. I it, I promise this will all come together shortly. Okay, I know that there's a lot of little details. A lot of them will will start coming together very soon. So uh, David says, sure, yeah, you can see me, but I'm going to have a bargaining chip. Like, you're, I'm not just going to take it just like that. If, if you're serious, you want to work with me, then bring me my wife. Because if you remember, he was married to Michael, and then, which was Saul's daughter, right? And um, while David was out and about... Um, running away from Saul, Saul married Michael to another guy. Just, just like that. Yeah, kind of messed up. So he says, I'll, I'll work with you, Abner. Bring, bring me my wife back from Israel, and, and, then, and then we can work together. And so they do. Ishbosheth calls for Michael, and then... <laughs> I was telling Susie about this earlier. This is terrible. Because they call Michael, and they're bringing her back, and the dude, uh, what's his name? It's so funny that the Bible keeps these details, because it's just so out of left field. But it's... Uh, Yeah, uh, verse 15, it's chapter 3, verse 15. And Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Thaltiel, the son of Laish. And her husband went along with her, weeping behind her, <laughs> to <laughs> Bohurim. <laughs> Which is terrible. But to be fair, it was David's wife first. So here's, here's, um... Faltiel just he's just crying all the way there and they get to Abner and Abner is of course going to be the one that takes her to David because they're going to have the meeting and Abner sees this guy in verse 16 <laughs> and her husband went with her along weeping beside her to Bahurim then said Abner unto him go return <laughs> and he returned. returned and I just think that's so funny he's like yeah because because they call for Michael, David's wife. David's wife. This is David's wife. And the guy that stole her away comes crying, Behind following her. her the whole way. And Abner sees the guy and he's like, What are you doing here? Get out of here! Go home! 
I just thought that was so funny. It's completely irrelevant. It's it's, funny. it's just funny. It's one of those things that would have been passing. It's just in there. It's just it's just there. The Bible's great. And so Abner gets to uh, David. David throws on a big feast. And they're working together. And David talks with him, and they come up with some plans so that Abner can start, you know, translating the kingdom to David. You know, he's going to go back to Israel, and he's going to start putting in some word and letting people know what was supposed to happen to begin with. He's full in. Probably not for the right reasons. I still don't think Abner's a good guy, because... He knew that right. David was supposed to be king the whole time, and he only decided to change teams when someone called him mean words. Right. He has no loyalty, but he's, on, he's full in on David's team for now. We guess. Um, he at least seemed like it. And then David talks with him, and they finish their feast, and David lets Abner go. Now, that guy Joab, this is when things are going to start coming back together. This is when things are going to tie in. So let's go to verse chapter 3, verse 21. <clears throat> and this, this is what I was just talking about. And Abner said unto David, I will arise and go, and will gather all Israel unto me. My lord the king, that they may make a league with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. That's what I was just telling you about. Now here's this guy Joab coming up. And behold, the servants of David and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was... Not with David, David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the host that was with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he hath sent him away, and he's gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came, in, came unto thee. Why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is quite gone? Thou knowest, Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, and that thou knowest, and to know thy going out, and thy coming in, and to know all that thou doest. And so Joab really doesn't like this Abner guy. He doesn't believe him at all. Remember, he's holding a grudge. Yeah. So I, you don't know if this is emotions. Well, it's definitely emotions getting in the way. But to be fair, nobody trusts Abner. <laughs> don't trust Abner. Bad guy. Um... But Joab's upset. He's like, this guy came into your court. You had him right there in front of you, and you didn't just kill him? This is the guy that, was, that waged an entire war. He's the guy that said you weren't the rightful king. He's the guy that set up Ishbosheth to steal your throne. He's the one that, he's been putting all this stuff. He's, he's been pulling the strings. And you, you just let him go? What, you guys are friends now? You just let him go. You didn't, you didn't punish him or anything? Verse 26, And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sirah. But David knew it not. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly. And he smote him there under the fifth rib that he died for the blood of Asiel, his brother. He murders him. Joab takes it into his own hands. He takes it into his own hands and he kills Abner. Abner had already given up on Ishbosheth. He wasn't part of that thing anymore. But Joab, he takes it personal. He takes it into his own hands and he kills him. Verse 28, and afterward, when David heard of it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever from the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest upon the head of Joab and on his father's house, and let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue 
or that is a leper, or that leaneth upon a staff, or that falleth on the sword, or that lacketh bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner, because he had slain their brother, Asiel, at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab and to all the people that were with him, Rend your clothes, gird you with sackcloth, and mourn before Abner. And King David himself followed the bier. And they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put in fetters. As a man falleth before wicked men, so fallest thou. And all the people wept again over him. And when the people came to cause David to eat while it was yet day, David sware, saying, so do God to me, or more so, if I taste bread or aught else, till the sun be down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people and all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to slay Abner, the son of Ner. Now this guy, you know, Saul died at the beginning. Now this guy, Abner's dead. David didn't have anything to do with either. Both of these guys were a big issue for David. And both of these guys were justifiably within means that David could have still been the good guy killing these guys. Right? This last guy, Ishbosheth. This one's a little bit quicker. Um, chapter 4, verse 1. When the Saul's sons heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Bana, and the name of the other was Rechab, the sons of Rimon, a beer Hurite, and the children of Benjamin. And if we skip over to verse 5, And the sons of Rimon, of beer Hurite, Rechab and Bana went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay upon a bed at noon. And they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under the fifth rib, and Rechab and Bana, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay upon his bed in his bedchamber, and they smote him, and slew him, and beheaded him, and took his head, and gat them away through the plain all night. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron, and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life. And the Lord hath avenged my lord, the king, this day of Saul and his seed. And so there's Ishbosheth. He just got assassinated while he slept. And David didn't have anything to do with it. And then again, kind of like what happened with Saul. Uh, verse 9, And David answered Rechab and Benah his brother, the sons of Rimon, the Behetherite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity? When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag. Who thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings? How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house upon his bed? Shall I not therefore require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they slew them, and cut off their hands and their feet, and they hanged them up um, over the pool in Hebron. So, here's three guys. <coughs> what can we learn from this? This is basically the same lesson over and over again. That's how important of a lesson it is. Just because there's opportunity does not mean you need to take it into your own hands. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was a kid, I was told that um, when the Lord gives you an opportunity, you need to take it, and that's how you walk in the Spirit. That's how you follow the Spirit of God. And that's just not true. Because here's perfect opportunity, and it wasn't of God to take it into David's own hands, right? Just because something is so perfectly put in front of you doesn't mean it's of God. That's right. David could have killed Saul at least twice. Saul was trying to murder him. It could have been self-defense. 
He was supposed to be the king. He could have just been taking the kingdom like it was promised to him. And he didn't. He didn't take it into his own hands. Guess what? That problem, you know, Saul trying to kill him and trying to keep him out of the kingdom forever, it was solved. It was figured out. And David didn't have to be the one to do it. David didn't have to do the dirty work. It was fixed. It was solved. That blood wasn't on David's hands. And Abner, he was the one plotting. He's the one that put Ishbosheth against David. He's, it says that they killed 20 of David's men that day, which, by the way, L, because Ishbosheth lost like 320. Loser. Um, <laughs> but Abner was completely against David, and it could have been completely justifiably right and righteous to kill Abner. And he didn't. And then when Joab took it into his own hands, David saw that as a, as a negative thing. Again, all these times, like I said in the beginning, David didn't look at the negative in any of it. He saw the positive in these guys, which did not deserve the positive. But David chose to see the positive in it. David's hands were clean of Abner. He had nothing to do with it. Abner was a problem for sure. And if Abner stayed in the kingdom under David, he more than likely would have been more problems. And David took that anyway. He, he would have let him be there. So when, when Abner was taken care of and he was a problem, it wasn't on David. David had the opportunity and didn't take that opportunity. Ishbosheth, the guy that stole the throne from David. Again, David had all justifiable reason to take this guy out. I mean, this guy was committing treason. He had stole the, stolen the kingdom. Uh, there's probably a pretty good argument that he was not even um, qualified whatsoever. But David, David didn't take it into his own hands. And guess what? That problem was solved. And David's hands got to stay clean. That's right. And so that's, that's the lesson for tonight is just because something is put in front of you and even if it justifiably you can say that you're in the right in it doesn't mean you need to take it into your own hands. It doesn't have to be us to do the dirty work or even if somehow it seems like we can be right in it. We don't have to. Now if the Lord is telling you you know, you look back all through 1 Samuel, all those times that David said, Lord, should I go up to fight these people? And the Lord said, yeah, go. Then go. But just because they're there in front of you, and you could beat these guys easy. You can take them. That doesn't mean you should. So that, that's my lesson. Mm -hmm. It's a great message. I got a bunch a bunch of stuff out of it. I'll just I'll just say this. Um Because I, I, I hear stuff like this all the time. You know, you hear... I hear people say, well, well, I guess, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. And, and of, of course, that's referring to, you know, well, God didn't mean it to happen. God didn't... It wasn't meant to be of God. Well, there's the opposite of that I hear so often. Um, guess it's just meant to be. A, it just keeps turning up. It just keeps turning up. I keep, I keep seeing this thing. Must be God wanting me to do this thing see this thing, be part of this thing. I keep hearing this thing. 
must be God. I, I, I must. That's not true. That's not true. That's that was the lesson tonight. Just because it's being presented before you doesn't mean it's it's of God. Um, for us today. It was three great examples. Three wonderful... Boy, I got some other things out of this, and I'm so tempted to go there, but that wasn't the message tonight. But three great examples. But for us today, think of a couple of things. Who is the prince of the power of the air? So you keep hearing something on the radio... You keep seeing something on your computer screen. You keep seeing something on, on Netflix or, or you keep hearing something on the radio. Do you understand all that is because of algorithms nowadays? That is not of God. That has nothing to do with God. That has more to do with if you're, going, if you're going to place spiritual blame on that stuff, that has more to do with Satan than it does with God. Even if, even if you think it has godly basis, it has to do with algorithms more than it has to do with spirituality. You keep seeing stuff over and over because you've searched for it or when it comes up, you've watched it or listened to it so it comes up again or it plays again. It's algorithms. It's not the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it's just like one illustration, then I'm done. It's just like your phone's now have these, uh, uh, what, what's it called, NFT readers? Mm, QR codes? Um, well, what's the, no, not the QR codes, they're um, NFC readers. Mm -hmm. It's what allows you to, like if you have Google Pay or Apple Pay and you can just run your phone over the scanner and it'll pay for stuff yeah. out, of your, out of your account. Well, they now put those tags next to the price tag in these big stores. Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, Costco, Sam's Club. So if you stand there and you're looking at something on the shelf for more than just a minute or two, and you have your phone out, or you walk by it and you're there for more than just a, a few seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and that NFC reads through your phone. Have you ever went home and got on Facebook or something and noticed that something you was looking at at the store, you're all of a sudden seeing ads for it on Facebook? Mm. It's not an accident. It's your NFC reader. It wasn't of God. <laughs> it's algorithms. It's NFC readers. It's listening to you. Oh man, there goes my puppy argument. Exactly. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's algorithms. I mean, and it could even be things like jobs, job opportunities. Job opportunities. Good, and it just looks so good. Cars. But just because it looks good and it's put in front of you doesn't mean it's got the good. That's right. That's right. You know what? <laughs> that job that pays more, that could be that could be a temptation from the devil rather than a blessing from God. You gotta pray about that. You gotta make sure that that's what God wants for you. Is it going to take you out of church on Sunday? Is it going to move you away from a good godly church? 
You got to pray about that. You got to make sure that's of God. It's not always just because the opportunity exists doesn't mean it's the opportunity to take. Even if, as he said, it appears to be justifiable. Amen. What a message. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this night. We thank you for the message you've given us. I just pray you would help us to take it, meditate on it. Hopefully we might have wrote a few verses down or thanks to the, the gift you've given us of the internet and, and YouTube and, and, and Facebook in this respect. We can go back and we can watch it again and, and get the Bible verses and, and passages that you showed us tonight and reread and read around and read in front of and after and, and get an even, even fuller picture of, uh, of what you, you showed us here tonight and, and spend some more time doing just that and, and getting a, a, a bigger glimpse of, of you and your character and, and, and what you would have for us. So now help us do just that, spending time in your word, spending time with you. And we just thank you for this, this opportunity of fellowship, study, and, uh, and prayer. As we shared the prayer request before the, the Bible study started, praying for those that need you, praying for those that are down and uh, hurting, injured, uh, physically, mentally, um, whatever their needs are, whatever our needs are, Lord, we just ask you to meet them all. And um, we just thank you and love you. If there's anyone out there that, that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that you would take this moment to speak to the Lord, confess your sin, and ask Jesus into your heart to save you from your sin. Uh, the, the day is approaching, and, and the day of salvation grows near. So if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, do that right now. Just bow your head. Ask Jesus into your heart. Confess your sin to God. And he's faithful and just to forgive you your sin. If you'd like to have more information on what you've heard about tonight, about this, salvation, contact us here at the church. I'd be more than happy to talk further with you about it. Father, we thank you. We love you. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night.